getting started right now. Okay. And welcome. Thank you. My Hello. name is Georgia Court, and I'm so glad to see uh, familiar faces, new faces. I see Sue Nussbaum, I see Christine Hoffman, and Don McLoggan, and Linda Albert, and Michael Waters, and it's so good, and Carla Lynn is here. So good to have so many of you with us this evening. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. I would ask that you mute yourselves, please, just so that we don't have any extraneous noise in the background well, while we are uh, hearing the reading. And at the end of the reading, there will be a, a time for you to unmute and discuss and, and speak with the author and make whatever comments. But for the moment, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Georgia Court. I'm the proprietor of bookstore oh, huh. number one in Sarasota. And uh, I'm, I'm loving welcoming, welcoming all of you on yeah. the bookstore's 10th anniversary. And I hear some people who have not muted themselves. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be great. Uh, this is our 10th anniversary. <laughs> and today, March 1st of 2011, was the first day that we opened our doors. And Bill Hayen was there and he helped us celebrate the opening. And he read his poetry. And it was a wonderful event that people talked about literally years later. And uh, I'm so thrilled that Bill agreed to come back and to reprise his wonderful, his wonderful presentation of 10 years ago, although I don't expect you, Bill, to read the same poems. Right. <laughs> I hope not anyway. But I'm going to take a minute uh, or two to truly introduce William Hayen, because I see several people on this call. So several of you I know, because you were chatting, that you know Bill. But a good portion of the people on this call don't necessarily know William Hayen. Uh, they're Sarasotans, and I can see them coming in, so he might be a new name to them. So here it is. William Hayen is professor of English and poet in residence emeritus at the College of Brockport in New York State, which is part of the SUNY system. He holds a PhD from Ohio University and was awarded an honorary doctorate of humane letters from SUNY a former senior Fulbright lecturer in Germany and a Guggenheim fellow has won NEA, American Academy of Arts and Letters, Pushcart and other prizes. His poetry has been published in hundreds of anthologies and in magazines, including the New Yorker, Harper's, The Atlantic, The Southern Review and the American Poetry Review. He is the author or editor of 40 or more books won the Small Press Book Award for Crazy Horse and Stillness, was a National Book Award finalist for Showa Train, and two of his books have been Chautauqua Literary and Scientific Circle selections. His diary journal, five volumes of which have been published so far, and enough written for 10 more apparently, is the most extensive by any poet in our literature. Nature, Selected in New Poems, 1970 to 2020. His newest book has just now appeared in hardcover to mark his 80th year. And by the way, in the chat function, if you look, I have put links, two links to Bill's books where you can purchase them directly. And one of them is a link to several volumes of his um, earlier works and one of the links is specifically to this brand new work, uh, Nature, New and Selected Poems. So with that, please welcome my friend of Bill, it's 20 years now, believe it or not. Please welcome my friend of 20 years, there you go. Fab fabulous poet, Yippee. William Yippee. 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 Well, I guess, I, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. yes. Georgia, thank you so much. It's it's very touching to be here with you and with so many friends. So, uh, 
this technology uh, makes me nervous. And I mentioned it to my friend, Bart White, and he said, well, it's better than a root canal or a colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but it's, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, well, hello, and thank you for so many kindnesses. I do remember that reading 10 years ago. We got with my wife and I, uh, with Carla Merrifield, made our way to the store, enjoyed ourselves. I remember uh, reading or reciting poems by other poets to sort of bring them into the atmosphere of the store. I haven't been to your new digs yet, maybe some year, who knows? So uh, anyway, thank you enough. Awfully uh, grateful, glad to be here. <clears throat> I always have a few notes for myself about what I want to do and read, and then I forget the notes. But I know I wanted to begin with uh, the poem. It's by Robert Penn Warren that probably is more important to me than any other poem I've read in my life when it comes to short lyrics. This is the final section of his uh, book length poem called Audubon, A Vision. The, the poem is in the, the other seven sections are in the third person. And then all of a sudden at the end, he becomes very personal. And all of us who write are interested in the ways that poets get the closure. So anyway, here it is. Uh, here's the eighth section. It's, it's very touching for me. <clears throat> Long ago in Kentucky, I, a boy, stood by a dirt road in first dark and heard the great geese hoot northward. I could not see them, there being no moon and stars sparse. I could only hear them. I did not know what was happening in my heart. This was the season before the elderberry bloomed. Therefore, the geese were flying north. The sound was passing northward. Tell me a story. In this century and moment of mania, tell me a story. Make it a story of great distances and starlight. The name of the story will be time but you must not pronounce its name. Tell me a story of deep delight. You know, Archibald McLeish said that our poems have to be smarter than we are and go on thinking about themselves longer than we ever do. Every time I say that poem to myself, probably at least once a day, I keep hearing new things in it. Uh, time. You must not pronounce its name, whatever that means. If we pay too close attention to it, we'll probably go berserk. I mean, I've blinked my eyes now and it's been 10 years since I stood in George's store and, and probably said that poem. So there we are. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know, and this will fit in. Georgia mentioned my journals. I write in my journal every day. Um, I think it probably is the most extensive uh, journal in our literature, except for maybe John Quincy Adams. I understand that he began his when he was eight or 10 years old and he's lasted into his 90s. And uh, you know, to say it's the uh, longest <laughs> isn't to praise it. I'm not saying it's the best, but uh, Little by little, I type it up. Five volumes are in print, quarto size, 10 point type, 550 pages. And I'm, I'm, I've got enough more for another 10 volumes. I wrote this this morning and not with the intention of reading it, but I think I'll read it. It fits in with the, <clears throat> with the, the Robert Penn Warren poem. 3-1-21, Monday. Just now, I wrote the date and then didn't begin this section or this sentence for five to 10 minutes. Just closed my eyes and let a stream of memories take over. I'll begin tonight with that last section of RPW's Audubon, A Vision. 
So I was remembering going to my English department mailbox, maybe 40 years ago, and receiving a postcard from the man, congratulating me on my poems in poetry. Fast forward decades to my meeting him at Greenfield Community College at that McLeish occasion. And my slipcase copy of Audubon is in the University of Rochester room. But I have the poem here in a collected volume. The sound was passing northward. The poem is about our oral experiences. Red, that's Red Warren, never got to Brockport except by way of sound. And he is still here with me now by way of sound. And I'll sound him this evening. When I was teaching, it was more of a life in the present for me, the day-to-day -day classroom and office work, and then family time and poker time, committees, letters of rec to write, student journals to take home and read, mowing and splitting wood, reading trips in the present, playing basketball a few times a week in the present, going to the kids' activities in the present. Now I have all this quiet time, even without my cabin. My wife and I moved a few years ago. I do not want to travel. I feel time's winged chariot. Working on my book list yesterday, I found a plastic sleeve with a few postcard poems by, from William Stafford and a letter from Dorothy after her husband had passed. And I didn't want to pronounce time's name too clearly. Maybe this is why some people never want to retire. They want to stay in the present, avoid the condition of constant reminiscence. How lucky I am to have nature in print. It remembers for me and will. And Warren's directive and plea, tell me a story. And that story well told will be revelatory of the two natures. I didn't know I read that. The two natures are the two natures in my big book, Nature, which I just, I, I wanna hold up. I can only see myself in the corner over there, but uh, 50 years of poems in this book. And there's an, an essay in the middle of it about the two natures, that is primal nature, natural nature, which I experienced in essence as a child. My mother called me nature boy. I went through those Long Island woods and waded those ponds and I was the only one around. So there's that nature. And then there's natural, and then there's the, then there's the human nature that can lead, for example, to the Holocaust. Maybe the third of this book is about that, but it has this beautiful cover by Roseanne Mascari. Every day I, I sit with it in my lap for a little while and say, look at that and look at that and look at the memories. Look at the memories in a book. How did it happen? I haven't read any poems and I'm babbling too much, but Robert Penn Warren says, tell me a story. When I was uh, 15 or 16 years old at Smithtown High School on Long Island, I was walking through the hall one day and I passed my basketball, soccer and baseball coach. And he said, Billy, you ever think of going to college? And I said, no coach. You know, I thought maybe I'd go into my father's woodworking business or whatever, but he took me and two friends to see West Point play Brockport. I'd never heard of Brockport in soccer. Before I knew it, I had an interview and I was headed to, to Brockport. Uh, tell me a story. So, uh, you know, some of us feel we get to where we are in life by careful steps that we make. Others of us are just sort of falling forward, you know? So I don't know, tell me a story. Hmm. Yeah. Let me see what I had in mind. Oh, I'm gonna uh, have a little fun and maybe uh, anger a couple of people with a poem. But uh, 
I'm going to lead up to this poem by reading, by saying a couple of other poems, right? Uh, this one is called, this one's called Red Wings. I should know it. Maybe you've noticed that around here, red winged blackbirds aren't rare, but aren't seen often either. And then at distance, banking away from roads as we pass. But one morning I saw a hundred more feeding on seed I'd spread under a line of pines planted more than a hundred years before. Almost at rest, their feathers folded close. Only yellow wing bars break their black bodies. But when all at once, as they did, they lifted that red. I've tried for a long time and maybe should to tell you how the disembodied red wings flared and vanished. I've lost them in every telling. So much for me. I could die now anyway, could you? We will close our eyes and rest in case the blackbirds in slow motion assume again the flames they are and rise. And this one, I should know it, let me, let me see. This one is called Black, Blackbird Spring goes something like this. Mid-morning, walking ocean shoreline, I found a hundred blackbirds frozen in ice. Only their heads protruding, black eyes open, gleaming, most of their sharp beaks still scissoring in mid-whistle. Feeding, they'd been caught in sea spray, must be. All males, up north early, scarlet appallets aflame, a few inches under. Kneeling, I broke one bird loose with a stone, held it in gloved hands under the rising sun until, until I realized nothing I hadn't known. The tide retreated and would return Within the austere territories, these would have filled with belligerence and song, spring had begun. Well, that's preparatory to the poem I wanna, that the poem I wanna read you. Yeah. This poem is called Blackbirds. I wanna mention that uh, there's a phrase in here, I celebrate myself. And it comes from uh, Walt Whitman, you know. I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume, so shall you assume, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. Now, this, this poem gets some people angry, but I think it's people angry who really don't have a sense of how poems have to be read, you know? But I'll, maybe I'll talk about that. <laughs> Anyway, so here's, here's this poem and it's called Blackbirds. No, I'm not protesting too much when I say, I wouldn't want to be Paul McCartney who is launching, this is 2013, a US tour requiring 31 trucks of equipment, including lasers, huge pyrotechnics, explosives, state-of-the-art video displays. At one point in the show, Sir Paul will rise 20 feet above the stage in a spiral construct as he performs Blackbird and here today, acoustically. Imagine being one of the old Beatles, traveling to sold out arenas where berserk fans want your DNA. So your bodyguards have to cut a swath through them and through paparazzi. And you become caricature with makeup and rush through changes of clothes and whole industries of roadies and technicians 
and record labels and vendors of Mary Jane and hot dogs and memorabilia expect you to deliver? No, I am not protesting too much. He's my age. I love this easy chair of mine, candle and coffee and cursive. Sure, I'd like money, enough of it to fund my four grandkids' college educations, pay off a couple family mortgages, but all that hype and blare, that travel, and the burnished oldies receding, hey Jude, and yesterday, and John in his grave, and George in his strawberry fields. Don't you and Ringo just want to stay home wherever home is? Don't you just yearn, Paul, to compose something even better than what you've done? Aren't you gut sick of spending your power in such disquiet? Wouldn't you withdraw if you could? Aren't you, compared to me, unhappy? They're all screaming. You're 70 and spiraling up through colored smoke. You're trying to sing acoustically Blackbird, while my own red wings and Blackbird spring are much better. I'm insufferable to say it, but it's true. I celebrate myself. You could build on your book of lyrics, Blackbird singing, couldn't you? I'm going to write better every year, are you, Paul? You're wearing too much rouge and lipstick this spring day as the males have returned to marshes hereabouts to declare their territories. Look, look at their bright red gashes. Hear, hear their warning songs. So, you know, I really did lose a friend because of that poem. He was so angry at me, but the job of a poem is to convince you of its truths while you are inside it and maybe while you're writing it. So this guy, I'll put it in the third person now, although when I write with the eye, I'm writing out of myself. He begins by saying, no, I'm not protesting too much when I say I wouldn't want to be Paul McCartney. When I was sitting down that morning or that day and writing that poem, comfortable in my easy chair, I always keep a candle burning I've got my cursive working. I'm a happy man. And of course, I don't know what it feels like for Paul, but at the time he was about to get thrust up into the air <laughs> and play an instrument acoustically. And I keep thinking of all these people depending on him. He's a great man. I hope he's happy. I wouldn't trade places with him. As the guy in the poem says, yeah, I'd like the money in order to help out the family. So I'm glad to be so, but, Again, that poem has made people has made people angry. I really don't understand. You know, somebody said that Emily Dickinson could write a poem in the morning saying she didn't believe in God and write a poem in the afternoon in which she praised God and was sure of his existence. For all I know, I could wake up tomorrow morning and say, yes, uh, I sure would like to be Paul McCartney. You know, so I don't know. Tell me a story, Robert Penn Warren says. That poem is maybe a story about a guy who's trying to place himself and he realizes he really wouldn't want to be the kind of a person who couldn't even walk down the street without people momming him, you know? So anyway, but I, I, I hope that someone reading the poem would say, yeah, I believe the guy's sincere. <laughs> he wouldn't want to be Paul McCartney. I've talked about it too much and I'll, I could talk about it a lot more, but there's Walt, I celebrate myself, you know, the great spontaneous Walt. In the old days, when I was in graduate school, poems took me a long time to write. I mean, you know, I'd go to 10, 20, 30 revisions. Now they seem to come fairly quickly because I'm telling a story rhythmically and I keep going. Of course, whatever craft I have has been learned over decades and decades, a kind of concentration that goes on so that even when I set down lines, I've already revised them in my head and felt them that way. So anyway, that's, that's called Blackbirds. It's in the last section of this big book, which is called Nature. You know? So I suppose that's a, that's a poem of the two natures. 
the nature of the guy who's speaking and uh, you know the idea of blackbirds soaring into the poem. So anyway, when I've got my eye on the clock here. I think I've got maybe five or 10 minutes left. Uh, I'll read a poem that's very important to me because of what I've done. This is amazing to have a 700 page book like this. And it's, there are some complete book length poems in it, but I've really cut back on things. I mean, out of 40 poems in my first book, there are only about 10 in this one, et cetera, et cetera. So, Uh, here's the deal. Over the years, you know, we always hear, we don't choose our poems, they choose up, they choose us. And hopefully, whenever I've written about the Holocaust, I, or about Hiroshima, uh, hopefully, or about the, uh, about Nam or about the Gulf War. Hopefully those poems have chosen me. I've had to write them. I've been obsessed by some things. Now, whatever the subject matter is, I've tried to write strong poems to make something on the page that I care for. So there's always that sense of, uh, of possible obscenity in trying to make a kind of artistic beauty out of uh, out of uh, death and uh, the obscene things that happened in our history. So there's always that. I've got this poem called A Poetics of Hiroshima that faces that question, right? So listen to this guy. I guess right, I hadn't really thought about this, but right from the beginning, a poetics of Hiroshima, it's like oxymoronic, isn't it? <clears throat> I'd read in the local papers that a man I knew, I'd sat in on a couple of his Zen classes, uh, uh, I'd read about him and his experiences as coach for the American judo team, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, so most of this poem came pretty fast. Yes, just listen to this guy myself as I'm trying to deal with that question. Aesthetics versus uh, the terror of something that we can't understand. A Poetics of Hiroshima. Imperial Air Force pilot Sashio Oshida, unable to fly over the burning city to report to his superiors what had happened to it, landed his plane, borrowed a bicycle, and pedaled into it. He'd remember a woman in front of her smoldering home, a bucket on her arm. Inside the bucket was a baby's head. The woman's daughter had been killed when the bomb fell. This is atrocity. You've just now descended from a stanza wherein a baby's head, where its eyes open or closed, was carried in a bucket by her mother. An Imperial Air Force pilot stopped his bike in front of what had been her home. I've wanted us to breathe ashes and smoke, but we cannot. This too is atrocity. What's true for me is probably true for you. I'm tired of trying to remember this. Somewhere in Hiroshima, the baby's head is dreaming wordlessly. No, it is not. This too is atrocity. Ashida went on to live a long life he felt the swing and weight of that bucket on his arm. No, he did not. He did. He sometimes dreamed himself pedaling backwards away from that mother. 
I don't know whether he did or not. Meanwhile, we rave about the necessity of a jewel center in every poem. I've used a baby's head in a bucket on her mother's arm. Whether this is art or in the hands of a master could be, or whether art is atrocity or not, I'm sick of being or trying to be part of it. Me with my weak auxiliary verbs, which vitiate the jewel center. Me with my passives, my compromised stanzaic integrity, my use of the ambiguous this, which is atrocity. No, it is not, it is. For years, my old high school coach visited my home with dahlias in a bucket, big red purple and blue purple heads. My wife and I floated in bowls on our tables. Have I no shame? This too, this story that evokes another, this narrative rhyme, this sweet concatenation of metaphor is atrocity. Coach fought on Iwo Jima for 10 days before and 10 days after the flag raising on Mount Suribachi. 50 years later, he returned there, brought me a baby food jar half filled with black sand from one volcanic blood soaked beach. He did. But at marine reunions, he couldn't locate any of his buddies from his first outfit. No, he could not. He once laid out on my desk aerial photos of runways the Japanese used to wreak havoc, his words, and said that hundreds of thousands of GIs would have died if HST had not given the order. As a participant in necessary atrocity, I agreed. I still agree. But it doesn't matter if I agree. What matters is whether poetry itself agrees. Incidentally, Ashida was in training to become a divine wind, a kamikaze. Incidentally, in later decades, Ashida himself came to agree that the bombing of Hiroshima was absolute necessity. He did but it doesn't matter if even Ashida agreed. What matters is whether the human heart agrees. What matters is whether art will ever agree. 1945, I was almost five. Colonel Tibbetts named our Enola Gay for his mother. The 6th of August, our bomb little boy mushroomed with the force of 15 kilotons of TNT, a harnessing of the basic power of the universe, said HST, as though the universe were our plow horse. In the woman's home, her daughter was beheaded. I don't know if Ashida learned exactly how, though we and the art of atrocity would like to know. In any case, what could this mother do? She lifted her daughter's head. She laid it in the aforementioned jewel center. She was not thinking of the basic power of the universe. Did she place oleander blossoms on her baby's face? Did she enfold her daughter's head in silk, which rhymes with bucket and sick and volcanic and wreak havoc? Buckets appear often, as a matter of fact, in the literature of exile. For example, in Irina Ratashinskaya's prison memoir, gray is the color of hope. Coal buckets and slop buckets, ersatz food placed in what were empty toilets. Time to get up, woman, empty your slop bucket. Irina drags her bucket daily to the cesspit. She doesn't know if she can ever become a mother. Ashida attained the highest black belt, went on to coach the American Olympic judo team. He did. I spoke with his daughter at an event where I received a poetry prize. 
a check for a thousand George Washingtons and an etched glass compote for a book on the Shoah. I said I once heard her father lecture on Zen, the moon in the river, river flowing by that is the world with its agonies, while moon remains in one place, steadfast despite atrocity. I remember that she seemed at ease, she who had known her father, as I could never. While teaching at the University of Hawaii, I visited Pearl Harbor three times, launched out to the memorial above the Arizona. Below us, the tomb rusted away, 1,177 sailors and Marines, average age 19, killed that day. For nature too is atrocity, atoms transformed within it, even memory. We tourists, some Japanese, watched minnows nibble at our lays. No, we did not. This was my... I knelt at a... Box, Pardon? My pretty girl. I'll just I'll, I'll finish this up. Go back a few sentences, please. Bill, you, you gotta unmute yourself. Bill. Unmute yourself, please. Would everyone else please mute? Yeah, and everyone else mute. Please, please unmute yourself, Bill, so, so we can hear you. When did that uh, happen? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, that just happened about a minute ago, Bill. Okay. You got to go back to when the fish were eating the, the, fly, the petals. Bill, right at the line, we tourists. Well, I'm wondering if I can skip a little bit, save a little time here, but it's okay. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll start right here. <clears throat> no, I don't even want to start there. I should probably drop it and let you folks get the thing, but I'll, I'll move to the end. Near the end, this guy says, I end my sixth line above with the word home. My first draft called it the woman's house, but home evokes satisfaction, mm, a baby's contentment at the breast, the atrocity of irony, and home hears itself in arm and bomb and blossom and looks forward to shame and tomb. I cannot not tell a lie Apparently, I am not so disgusted with atrocity as I'd claim to be. My atoms do not cohere against detonation. But now time has come, listen to the mmm in time and come for closure as out of the azure into the syntax of Hiroshima, little boy plunges. I've centered this poem both to mushroom and crumble its edges. And fat man, 21 kilotons of TNT will devastate Nagasaki. What is your history? Please don't leave before telling me. Believe me, I'm grateful for your enabling complicity. I know by now you've heard my elegiac E. I hope your exiled mind has bucketed its breath. I seek to compose intellectual melody. I fuse my fear with the idea of the holy. This is St. John's cloud of unknowing in me. This is the Tao of affliction in me. Don't try telling me my poetry is not both beguiling and ugly. Please help me integrate my own split psyche. There was no escape except to the river, a survivor said, but the river thronged with bodies. Black rain started falling, covering everything, the survivor said. 
I have no faith except in the half-life of atrocity. I seek radiations rhythmic sublime. I have no faith except in poetry. I seek the nebulous ends of time. This is the aria those cities have made of me. I hope my centered lines retain their integrity. I trust that this poem will candle me. I have no faith except in beauty. So, a poetics of Hiroshima. One of my longer lyric poems, I think, you know. Well, what to say? I'm, I'm, I've probably, I've gone over my time. Let, let me, let me read. Uh, I wanted to read a poem. No, can't, don't have time. Well, Bill, that's okay. We're, we're loving listening to you. So if you have one more poem you'd like to read, please do it. Okay. I was going to read a, a longer poem called Craig Cotter. I'll be son of a gun. Uh, Good to see you. I got out of work late. Sorry. I want to be sure everyone is muted before uh, Bill comes back to read his final poem. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to read two short poems. This is the poem. It's called Sayonara, and it ends my book, Hiroshima Suite which consists of, I don't know, 100 or 125, 15 line poems, but this is the last one. Sayonara. Long ago on Long Island, when I was a boy, I'd bike to ponds a couple, three miles away and to a lake with an Algonquin name, Ronkonkoma, which might've meant bottomless. One late winter morning after first thaw, I found several coins in the ice-washed sands and a sodden five-dollar greenback among water weeds. One midsummer evening when I needed to be home, I stood instead to watch sunset burn that water, then fall behind pavilions and a tree line on the far shore. There were bats then and bird calls and the green smells of my mostly uphill ride home past spectacle pond and crickets and the whoosh of my tires on tar. That sunset stayed, stays in my mind. The bursts of neural fire, the crimson beauty, the feeling that nothing could possibly extinguish that sun and then didn't. And then very quickly, this happens to be the poem that ends the whole book. And I'm back to my boyhood again. Yeah, this is called Nesconset. That's the little village on Long Island where I grew up. <clears throat> Nesconset. One morning when I was nine or 10, our principal called us outside. And we looked up from the front lawn of that Long Island village school to above a tree line to so many birds filling the flyway that the air vacuumed with wings, we heard the live long day. I can't remember whether the birds were leaving or returning or whether they were one species or mixed flocks. Hours of birds darkening the pilgrim sky. I still see us and hear their primal sound as we watch them as though this lesson of profusion would never end. I hope there's a world reprising the one we had here for so long. Maybe the birds flew to that one. This is my elegy and imagined consolation. Now it's your turn. Thank you very much for listening to, listening to all that. Uh, so, uh, a few times I lost myself within the poems. I was reading them and that's good not to be like within it and to uh, anyway, I'll stop babbling. Be beautiful reading. Uh, any anybody like to say something? I bet there are people out there who would love to to 
contribute if you want to put your hand up or just unmute yourself and say, hey. Hello. Uh, and identify yourself, please, because there are a lot of people on this call. This is Doug. Okay, Bill, Doug. Bill, just a word of thanks for, Thank you, for your influence, your uh, kindness. Um, my first book of yours was not poetry. It was Long Island Light. Um, and uh, I had those same bike paths in common. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but the one thing that I was most thankful for is uh, the last couple of times you visited uh, when we were still at the Main Street store. Right. Uh, you brought these little boxes with the bottles and the Emerson quotes and then the, the baseball poem card. Yeah. And that, it's funny, that had uh, quite an impression on me. And I have to, I have to do that sort of with bookmarks when I do a reading now. So thanks for that, too. Thank, thank you, Doug. Pleasure seeing you again. Yeah. Who else would like to say something? Hey, Bill, it's Jamie. Uh, I don't think you can see me because I'm in the car. I'm not driving. Uh, but <laughs> I just want to thank you. Um, that was wonderful. As a former student of Bill's, I have probably had occasion to hear him read uh, as many poems as anyone and probably more. And no offense, Bill, but it kind of ruins uh, reading it. So I don't know, like hearing you read the words, you know, to poems that I've read dozens of times, um, it makes me think about it differently. You know, you had talked about reading a poem for the millionth time you think about it differently. Hearing you read a poem that you wrote that I've read dozens of times makes me think about it differently. So thank you for the opportunity again. Well, thank you, Jamie. And considering that, I'd better make a recording of all 700 pages of this book. Yes, yes, please do. Yeah, yeah. You're a wonderful reader of your of your work, Bill. Well, but, I don't know. You know, but it's funny, but every time I hear myself read, I say, I go too fast, slow down. And I used to say to students, you know, you'd become immediately twice as good a reader of poetry as you are if you'd go slower. So yeah. I just, yeah. yeah. So who else wants to say anything? I see maybe Elsie does. Do I see Elsie? Good. Well, dear Bill, we're so delighted you're here today. And, and I'm gonna echo what Doug said. When you handed out those adorable little poems and baseball cards, I was at the store that night and I think I tried to grab as many as I could because I could not believe someone was giving this great gift. But Bill, you're so wonderful and the fact that you knew where Falmouth, Massachusetts was, I thought was the greatest gift in the world. So I'm just delighted to, to welcome you tonight. And may I also say, as someone who works at Bookstore One, to thank Georgia, because without Georgia, Bill would not have been at the store and a legion of poets who have come through during the past 10 years and opened the door to so many people in Sarasota and beyond. So Georgia, we thank you. And Bill, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I share with you, nearby where I live right now, there are black words galore and I have to be careful looking at them because there are also signs for alligators. So, Bill, thank you so much. We love you. Thank you, Elsie, likewise. I see Richard trying to say something, yes. Hi, my name is uh, Ricky. And uh, I think for over 40 years, I've been trying to say thank you to Bill in different ways. And I, I don't really have the words, but I, I thought of a couple of words that might work and I never thought of saying this, Bill, but. I remember years ago, you, you shared in a class, an essay you had written. I believe the title was Glad to be a Fool. And for 40 years, I taught English in high school for, for 32 years. And most of those 32 years, I remember telling the students that I 
this guy who's probably the smartest guy that I ever knew personally wrote this essay, Glad to be a Fool. And I, I guess what I want to say is, um, even though one of the main things I love about you is that you've affirmed for me some of my deepest feelings and made me feel that I'm, you know, that it's okay to think the way I think, even though I'm a minority very often in the way that I think. But beyond that, I think you've taught me the value of humility. And it's such an important thing that we need more of in this world, including myself. In all of your poems, it's, it's there. It's like this, even that, that, that beautiful um, poetics that, that you just read. It's, it's amazing to me that you could always be questioning yourself and, and open to learning. It's just so wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rick. And you know, we were talking about time. I'm at the point now where students of mine from decades ago have retired, like Rick <laughs> and my friend uh, Antonio Vallone and uh, other, other people. Yeah, you know, but on that point, when I retired, sometimes I felt I was younger than my students because the students wanted, you know, they wanted to stay within the, at the one plus one equals two empirical mode. And I wanted to like blitz out my mind. Uh, poetry must resist the intelligence almost successfully, Wallace Stevens says. I think maybe even successfully. You can still have a sense that a poem is finished if you can't figure out what it's about. John Berryman said that the mark of a strong poem is that if you don't know what it's about, you know you do want to go back and read it again. Something like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to, to stay young with uh, this art, that's the thing. Beautiful, man. Just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Dan, I just Dan Masterson would like to say yeah, something. Yeah. And, and I have to say this from my Dan before you start. Yep. Uh, when I first got to know Bill really well, Bill and his wife, Hanny, and Dan and Jan Masterson both together came to stay with me and my late husband in the house I had in Chautauqua. Right. And we had the best time. time I think of that so often and I and I think of the of the four of you as belonging together always but I'm wondering it might have been years since you've seen each other yeah it's, so Dan what did you want to ask well it's, it's just so good to see you again and, uh, and, and it's just uh mesmerizing to sit back and listen to you and uh, I guess I've read almost everything, and uh, it's just a, a perfect night. You made the whole night, and you you made the next week and the month and the year. And Dan, so nice of you, and I know we've lost touch. We were in fairly close touch for a lot of years, you know, and you had that yeah. website, and I... Yeah picture you at Chautauqua and everything. So good to see you both. Uh, well, great. There's there's the Chicago, Chautauqua lady. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Here I am. And there are others on this call also, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Georgia. Yes, yeah, Georgia. Definitely. Yeah. There, I hear Carol Townsend's voice uh, there. Susan Nussbaum is here. Karma Lloyd is here. Uh -huh. so, the, uh, so the gang's all here, I think. So who, who else would like to say something? Hey, there's a there's a fellow up there with his hand up, Michael yeah. Broomfield. Michael Broomfield. Okay. Michael is from, Michael is from New York City, and he is, and I'm not even exaggerating, the world's greatest bibliographer. He did half of the bibliography of John Updike. Um, he's done the bibliography of Robinson Jeffers, and now he's working on some others, including a Hayen, believe it or not. <laughs> it's the longest one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, good to see you again, Bill. It's been a while. Yeah. Good to see you, Michael. Any any comments, Michael? Anything you particularly want to say other than hey? No, not really. I, you know, as as someone else pointed out, hearing the uh, the poet read his work, it always sounds different than it sounds in your own head, making you wonder you know, which of you is right or whether you could both be right or whether there are, you know, a thousand other ways to read any poem, which, you know, if you go to see the same play over and over again, you notice the same thing. Hmm. Interesting comment. Other, other, other comments? 
Bill, I just wanted to say hello. It's great to see you. I'm sorry I got out of work late great. today. Yeah, great. But great to hear a couple of poems at the end. Is this being recorded where you guys can send us the link? Yes, this is being recorded. Yes. Ah, good. So everyone that logged in will get a link and I can hear the whole reading. I'm happy to send it. It'll Wonderful. be in a day or two because I always like to trim off the front end where weird things tend to happen. Thank so. you. <laughs> Bill, I've got bookshelf envy of you there in the background. I'm <laughs> no. But you know, by the way, uh, folks, one of my books is uh, called Straits Sweet for Craig Cotter and Frank O'Hara. And the whole thing is in this nature book has been reprinted here. So you'll, Craig has been so generous in allowing me to use letters of his and other things. What a, what a guy. He's really from the Greece, New York area, but he's, <laughs> you know, he's an expatriate all the way in California now. Mm -hmm. Born in Rochester, even. Yeah, it's great to see you. I'm glad I'll be able to hear the whole reading again soon. And anyone else? Yeah, Linda Albert. I, I see you there. I'm mute and let's, yeah. let's yes. hear you. I, I don't know if this is going to seem like gall, but I have to thank you for your permission, Bill. When you read, I've never, ever heard, I'm sorry to say, I did not know your work. And I'm just blown away by it so much that I can't remember which poet you were comparing your life to in the poem about wondering if you didn't have the more content life in your easy chair. Oh. And why I'm telling you this is I, I do writing practice with a friend once a week. And today we were writing about, um, based on a quote from Rollo May about creativity being the overcoming of limitations. And I ended up finding myself writing about um, um, Michelangelo <laughs> and then comparing that to my own work and wondering whether Michelangelo um, suffered doubts when he was trying to, to paint the Sistine Chapel. She, I thought it was just you know, a piece of junk, but when I read it out loud, she loved it. She really loved it. I said, you know, it's really gone. I don't know where Michelangelo came from and how I thought I should be I'm putting myself in his world and wondering if it was mine, but that's how they came together. So it's very nice to know that a man of your poetic stature <laughs> did something like that. Gives me a sense of permission. Great. And then I would say, as an old teacher, I'd say, well, don't rest with it now. Read it over to yourself tonight and then write part two. Keep yeah. it until you've got a book. <laughs> and Linda, by the way, is a very accomplished poet herself. So, um, so we, we're in good company here. Uh, who, who, anyone else? Did I see, um, do I see anyone else who'd like, is Kurt? Kurt Landefeld, you'll need to unmute Kurt. Kurt, are you trying to unmute? How about that? There you go, there you go. okay. So, uh, Bill, this is the first time I've heard or seen you, unlike many others here. Um, and I'm not sure if it's because I just listened to this other poem last night, but I just got a CD of the first recorded uh, reading of Howl by Allen Ginsberg in Reed College in February of 1956. And I just listened to it last night for the first time. And I couldn't help but feel, as you read the poetics of Hiroshima, a certain bracketing between Powell and your Hiroshima. And uh, probably would take a little bit of um, analysis to try to draw that through. But I, I felt like there was power in what you were saying. And I heard echoes of Ginsburg uh, in your words. and. Uh, while you were reading, I uh, emailed Doug and asked if I could get a copy of Nature. And I look forward to uh, picking it up at the bookstore. Thank you. Yeah, and by, and by the way, for all of you, just as a reminder, now uh, thanks, Kurt, for mentioning that. Uh, early on in the chat, I placed links, and I don't know if if um, if my copy paste will still be current. I'll try to cop. I'm, I'm going to paste whatever I've got. And there it is. Yeah, there it is. So there are the links again. If you do want to get an earlier volume of, um, of Bill's work or this new one, 
uh, nat nature selected in new poems. So anyway, it, 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 can, yeah. let, can I say, let me say one thing. Yeah. Reminded of this from Kurt. Um, many years ago, Allen Ginsberg came to Brockport and I was one of the two people who interviewed him. And it was a wonderful interview, but there he was with his harmonium, you know, this great beat legendary poet that I admired and I still admire him en enormously. And I was in my, uh, you know, my suit jacket and very careful and, you know, very careful about what I was doing, you know, and uh, it, it all went very well. Later on in the cafeteria, I was sitting by myself at a table having a cup of coffee and three or four tables over, Allen Ginsberg was there with Paul Blackburn and others in that gang, you know, and Ginsberg looked around and he stood up and he said, hey, Bill, he yelled over across the cafeteria, hey, Bill, come on over. To me, that's always been a symbolic moment. And I went over when he invited this assistant professor, stiff ass assistant professor, come on over. <laughs> and ever since then, you know, there have been those polls. There's been Allen Ginsberg and there's been say another of my heroes, Richard Wilbur. And where am I within those polls? That's the thing. But Bill, come on over. And he invited us all in, you know. Ginsburg wanted to invite the whole world, the whole community in to read poetry. Richard Wilbur said that poetry is a necessary art for a small minority of people. Where am I? I don't know. I keep writing. If I'm lucky, I get books into print. And it's not easy. So uh, here we are. Yes, Ginsberg, a hero of mine. Super. Any anyone else before we wrap up? Anyone else want to say anything? You know, in your Ginsberg story, one of his very last interviews before he passed away, and a young kid was interviewing him. And the first question is, "What does it mean? I've seen the best minds of my generation destroyed." And there's this pause, and Ginsberg says. It means I've seen the best minds of my generation. <laughs> and he just reread exactly what the kids said. Right, that's what it means. <laughs> fabulous. I have to tell you, this has been a fabulous 10 years and a fabulous, a fabulous reading tonight. And, and as I say, Bill was the very first person to read in the store on the very first day that we opened. He has been back once or twice, and, and, and those times with Carla Lynn, who, who's on this call also, herself a fabulous poet, and now tonight. And um, I have read so much of Bill's work, of Carla's work, and have enjoyed it. And Bill, I want your commitment right now that on our 20th anniversary, we'll do this again. You know something? I wrote Merwin once and said, looking forward to your 80th birthday. And he said, I don't want to hear about it. It spooks me. So I, uh, you know, I'll keep my fingers crossed and say, oh, well, I hope so. But okay, good. it's a nervous thing to commit to, but yes. Okay, 20, 20 years from now. Okay, we'll all be together, all of us. Okay, on this call, 20 years. Well, thank, thank, you, George. thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank all of you. Wonderful, Bill. Thank you, you, Georgia. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.